Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to yet another UserList workshop. We have an amazing guest today, and that is Nick Fogel, founder and CEO of Churnkey, the ultimate churn buster for, <laughs> for SaaS products. And we're going to talk about inflation, pricing, and churn. Hello, Nick. Glad to have you here today. Hey, Jane. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk about this stuff, although it it tends to be not exciting. It's kind of pessimistic, but uh, I'm excited to share some tips and strategies. with uh, Also very scary to implement it. So yeah, it's a touchy, touchy topic. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> For listeners who haven't heard of yourself or Turnkey, tell us what you do. What's your, what's your story there? Yeah. I'll give you the quick backstory of Turnkey. Uh, we previously founded another business called Wave. It was a first tool for podcasters to turn their audio into video. And we had incredibly high churn with this business. We talked to a business broker and they were like, you know, your valuation is just going to get hammered. Uh, you're not going to get acquired for what you want with a 13% churn rate. So we um, doubled down and spent a few years and probably $30,000 in consultants working on churn. And eventually we found something that worked really well. So when Wave did get acquired, we said, hey, we know what we want to do now. We want to work with founders and we want to help them to lower their churn. So Turnkey, as it exists today, is your one-stop shop for all things churn. We can automate your entire retention strategy with things like Dunning, which is the recovery for failed payments, as well as cancel flows. Um, and this is interesting. A lot of people don't realize it, but voluntary churn, that's when somebody clicks the dreaded cancel button on your website. That's usually twice as high as involuntary failed payment churn. Um, so a lot of people aren't doing anything about that. And that's our, our core flagship product is really uh, intelligent flows that are personalized to the individual customer and help to retain them. Awesome, awesome. And, but today we're gonna talk about churn as sort of a tangent topic to, to, to pricing. Yes, they're definitely related. <laughs> a bit of housekeeping. Uh, we're going to keep the talk at about 20, 25 minutes, and then we will have a Q&A session. So <clears throat> if you have any questions, welcome to drop them in the questions tab on the right. We're going to get them answered. And also, this is going to be recorded and automatically sent to you after the event is over and also published. So don't, don't dread if you have to jump off. It will be all recorded. No fret there. Uh, and with that, Nick, please do share your screen and uh, let's hear what you have no, to sure. say. How's that, Jane? Cool. Fantastic. Right. We can see yep. it. Yes. Great. Okay. So this is the Founder's Guide to Inflation. Really scary topic for a lot of people. I think unless you're living under a rock, you've been hearing about inflation for the past six months nonstop. You're probably already sick of hearing about it. Um, and I, I do. I love the this... title. Love the title. <laughs> love the title. <laughs> Preparing your business for turbulent economic conditions. Um, just and, and backstory for me, too. I finished undergraduate uh, in the trough of the great reset, the 2008 recession. Um, and then I went to law school, which was a horrible decision and um, graduated into a legal recession. Uh, so I had this like pessimistic uh, creature on my back that's always, you know, telling me like, you know, I, my business partners call me the Nostradamus of our team because I am continually thinking like bad things are coming and bad things are kind of like here now. So I'm like, I finally have something I can talk about. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is the Founder's Guide to Inflation. If you're not a founder, if you're a business operator, this will be applicable to you. And um, hopefully there's something informational for anybody. So feel free to jump in, ask questions in the chat. I'll be keeping an eye on it. Okay. So first off, let's talk about pricing. We're going to spend a lot of time over the next 20 minutes talking about your SaaS business. And if you don't run a SaaS business, uh, this is actually even more applicable to you because um, your margins may be a little tighter. So pricing and your inputs, the cost of operating your business are really compressing your profits. Um, this little visualization here shows you five different metro areas in the US and I'm going to click play here so you can get a, a still. 
So this is where we are right now, 2022. And you can see that inflation is not this constant thing. You see the headline figure, 9%, 10% come out. And that's what's in a lot of people's heads. But it's not as black and white as uh, the headlines make it out to be. This can be dependent on your business, on your location. I know I focus a lot of this talk on um, the U.S. numbers, but throughout the world, global inflation is high and some regions are higher, some are slightly lower. Uh, but this is applicable because wherever you live, you're going to have slightly different inflation. As you can see here, San Francisco, no surprises there. Um, and even areas like Raleigh, uh, which is a smaller metro area that's growing, um, it's increasing fast. So if you look at inflation as this is what I can buy with my money, this is my purchasing power, it's going to differ based on where you live. And as you can see in this little chart, in 2017, if you had a SaaS pricing plan or, or a product that sold for $100, this is how much you would have to increase it to just to meet inflation, just to maintain that same level of purchasing power. So in real terms, you're not increasing prices to make more money at the end of the day. You're just trying to keep up and maintain that same level of purchasing power. You know, I've seen this video like X number of times, and I'm just now realizing that it's it, like the absolute values it shows. <clears throat> it's uh, it's going from $100 to like to 20. It's ridiculously high. It's scary to look at that. And, you know, I think we have a tendency to think anecdotally and say, ah, this doesn't feel right. That's, you know, that's a lot of money in just a few years. But you look at things that you spend a lot of money on, right? You know, you go to the grocery store, you buy crappy foods. Those are a dollar more. You know, they're marginally more expensive. It may seem like healthcare, college education, assets like homes, the things that you really want to put your money in are, are exploding, particularly in certain metro areas. So as a business owner who is looking to hire, um, you know, your employees are going to require more pay to survive in those areas. So it ripples across everything. And as you look at these figures, I want you to think about it specifically to where you live, where your business operates, what your future plans are, and um, how this might be impacting you. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, I just had to give you a preview. All right, so real quick, uh, where are we now? Then I'm going to talk about inflation specifically and how things are changing. Then we're going to do a deep dive into SaaS pricing and how you can potentially mitigate the risk of a price hike. Then, as Jane mentioned, we'll open it up for a quick Q&A at the end. All right, so there are a lot of memes. I talked about this earlier. You have been inundated with inflation memes on social media. CNBC is talking about it constantly. I even see the Joe Biden sticker on the gas pump when I go there, like Joe Biden did this. Um, sometimes you have to really work to see past the noise. How is this actually impacting your business? Inflation is the highest it's been in um, 40 years. So this is impacting you. It's impacting you know everybody that um, operates in the economy with any kind of price sensitivity that is just about everybody. And you can see the memes are already outdated, right? Like uh, inflation's at 6.5%. That's you know old news. Um, yeah, so first we're going to be pessimistic and then we're going to shift to some optimism. Inflation is the highest it's been in 40 years. And like I said, unless you're living under a rock, you see it everywhere. If you're hiring right now, it's so hard to hire. And, um, you know, I recently tried to hire a, a salesperson and the resumes I was getting, people were, everybody wanted six figures as a base salary. Uh, one guy's sole experience was operating a five figure Robin Hood trading account. It's just, you know, th there is a crazy, um, it's crazy difficult right now if, if anybody's hiring. So to do a lot of this stuff, you've got to be able to increase your prices. Um, so that's the inflation side. The other side of this is the idea of a global recession. And as you can imagine, as consumers feel that pressure, things are getting more expensive. They have less discretionary income. If you run a B2C business, particularly, you're already feeling this through churn. You're seeing a lot higher churn over the last couple of months. You're seeing people who are um, becoming 
price sensitive, they're looking out at their subscriptions and being more proactive in canceling those. Got to share this. I know it's too small. We'll share the deck later. Um, but I, I love to share this. Uh, it's called end of good times email. If you haven't seen this before, it was written and it's published by Sequoia, you know, the one of the largest and most reputable venture capital firms in the world. And uh, back in 2008, there was a banking crisis. It's, you know, the whole house of cards around real estate is, is falling over and um, they have a giant portfolio of SaaS businesses and other back then, you know, SaaS was less popular than some of the um, B2C uh, social apps, but they sent this memo out to all the founders and it was basically saying, raise funding as soon as possible if you can, get acquired if you can't raise funding. <laughs> um, you need to be realistic about your valuations and um, you're, you're really going to have to like focus on survival for this period. I think the tone has shifted a little bit since 2008. This was an era where everybody was going, you know, get as many users as possible, grow as fast as possible, do the Facebook thing. And um, now things have shifted a little bit. We still see that with scooters and all kinds of, you know, craziness. But um, I think a lot of businesses are already focused on the idea of being profitable. So if we were to tailor this and rewrite it for today, I think the best thing that founders can do is if you can get profitable or increase your margins as fast as possible, you'll be better off and you'll be able to survive whatever comes next. It's incredibly empowering to be in a place where you're operating a business or running a business because at the end of the day, you can control your destiny. You can change prices. You can communicate with your users. You can do the research to understand how to increase prices increase your margins and actually survive rather than just being victim to your circumstance. We've got another one. And this just shows you the opposite side of that first chart I showed you where if you think of your money and let's say you, you save money every year and you're building up a surplus account in your business, you're just leaving that in a savings account. This is what would happen to that money over time. This is the purchasing power that $100 has from 2016 until where we are now in 2022. So it's it's mostly cut in half. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about inflation, okay? These were the good old days. See the house, $11,600 for this nice single family home. <laughs> I cannot imagine <laughs> what that thing sells for now. Um, and then on the other side, I went to McDonald's with my kids recently and uh, got a Big Mac meal. And it was like ten dollars for a for McDonald's, which used to be like the joke. Like when you were trying to be cheap, you go to McDonald's. It's, how's you know a meal from McDonald's? Ten bucks and even fuel like uh, I know in other areas, they've got a lot worse than I do here in Charleston, South Carolina. but. Uh, $4 at the pump is um, you know, it's definitely hitting your, uh, hitting your disposable income in a different way for a lot of people. Okay, last, um, well, I've got two more, but last slide around inflation statistics and um, how this is impacting things. I want to point this out because a lot of us tend to get anchored to what we hear and see. And that can create complacency when you're hearing, uh, you know, 6%, 7%, 8% inflation. It's, it's not a lot. But that measurement is based on a basket of goods. A lot of those are things that aren't as desirable for a lot of people. Um, if you look at things that are the most desirable, those are going to be the most expensive. And you'll notice the trend here. These have a human component. So anything that requires a person's time is going to be soaring almost exponentially up in, in some cases. And you can see this is only through 2018. Um, so you can see, uh, you know, used cars or something that it's way, way up compared to where it would have been before. Um, but yeah, the things you want, hospital services, uh, like any kind of medical care, college tuition, uh, it's crazy. Um, daycare, if you're a parent, I'm feeling the pain of that. Um, a lot of these things are just getting ridiculously expensive. and. We forget that we as business operators have employees 
and staff that have to pay for these things and they're saving for these things. And that is going to impact wages and what we have to pay people. So you look at annual pay for something like software engineers. For SaaS businesses, this is one of our biggest line items is hiring talented engineers. And again, this is not the most recent data. It's up through 2021, which was some of the most recent data I could find. But look at that inflection point over the pandemic. And as inflation has started to increase, these figures are probably closer to 140 now, um, just anecdotally what I'm seeing. So as you're thinking about your business, think about you know, some of these rising costs. This is a screenshot from our friend's article at Code Submit. They've had great success with this for SEO, like <laughs> just, uh, really? just proving the value of uh, research content. Yes, they have been quoted like all over the place. In that it, place. it is, Jane, <laughs> it is extremely, extremely difficult to find uh, centralized data that has any, um, you know, a large enough sample size to mm -hmm. show things like this. And something like software engineers, there are so many different types, languages, specialties, it can be hard to find a good average. And yeah, this is one of the best, most recent ones I found. All right, so back to this guy again. I don't wanna desensitize anybody to it from showing it to you too often, but uh, <laughs> you get the idea, right? Like this is what you should be doing if you want to retain your purchasing power. Is anybody doing this? Uh, I kind of doubt it. Um, with our last business, we waited way too late to raise prices. It's funny. Uh, each time we raised prices, we didn't really notice a drop off or anything. It was like this fear we had. It was unsubstantiated fear that we would lose users. Um, this is universal across founders and business owners we talk to. There are a lot of reasons why people make excuses or delay the decision to increase prices. I love this, uh, this meme, I had to use it here. This guy's <laughs> saying, um, you know, I, I run a SaaS business and my thought is you're increasing prices, right? You're, you're increasing prices, right? So why aren't you increasing prices when you have this? Well, there are a lot of reasons and these are valid reasons, right? You created this business, you, um, or, or you have formed these connections with your customers, you don't want to lose them. You don't want to alienate them or, or make them angry, particularly you know, if you're sensitive to the fact that other things are more expensive, inflation is more expensive. You're worried about damage to brand. There was a, um, I don't know, a lot of people saw the bare metrics announcement, which um, I mean, they, they got, they had a very hard time after they communicated um, their price increase to, to customers. And uh, that was, um, I don't know if you saw it, Jane, but all over social media, they got a lot of flack for the way they communicated um, it and the way they increased them. Yeah, they're uh, one housekeeping note. Your screen, both of your screens are suddenly blank. It's hmm. not just Eric. I also only hear your voice, but I don't see your media. Okay. Anybody try, in the chat? Let me uh, try I'm refreshing sure. maybe. Yeah. I'll unshare and reshare. Oh, that? it's it's back for me. It's back for me. Okay. Let's uh just reshare here. Uh-huh. Cool. Yes, I think we're we're good. Cool. Gary says it's all good. All right. Yeah. Bear so, Metrics uh, wrote a like a skyscraper email that didn't have <laughs> any specific details in it, but like a long, hard touching story that was like you couldn't imagine less meaning in that. Like it was totally a wonderful story from the standpoint of building a product and the hardships, but it was no reasoning for the customer. It was really like really, really challenging to read that. It, it really was. I, I know that they're run by a private equity firm now. They know what they're doing. And if you look at the revenue, they've doubled revenue, even though they've lost you know 200 customers out of 900 um, due to that price hike. But um, so that, that speaks to two things. Number one, that, that fear is justified that you could damage your brand or you could anger users by rolling this out in an incorrect way. Um, but on the other side too, even having done that, in some cases they increase prices 2X, even 3X. And despite that price hike, they doubled their revenue. So, you know, that's one thing to think about um, if you're totally logical and you're not, 
wanting to be empathetic and you're just viewing this as a numbers game, if you're increasing, you know, if you're doubling pricing, you could lose half your users and still be, you know, in the same position. But obviously we do not want to lose half of our <laughs> users. Um, so from a, a pure numbers point of view, it's hard to raise prices and, and lose out unless you're in a game where people are very price sensitive. And I'll talk in a little bit about how you can approach this in a relative risk-free way. Other things that might be stopping people though, time commitment, it is, it can feel arbitrary when you're raising prices. It's um, something a lot of people wanna go do crazy A-B tests. There's nothing wrong with that, but sometimes those things can delay the decision when in reality, you needed to raise prices three years ago, four years ago. Um, so don't let those excuses stop you. Start with a small price increase if, if you feel like you've gotta you know, have the perfect price, you know, gradually, increase it. Um, you don't have to get it perfectly right the first time. And it's it's a very qualitative kind of thing. It's very, very difficult to figure this out without first just doing it. So let's talk about the messaging. I mentioned the bare metrics situation and I could do a full teardown of that email. I know um, Patrick Campbell from ProfitWell did a really great deep dive into the email, what they could have done differently. Um, the problem with that email though, is it focused on all of the rising costs that the operators of bare metrics now have and all the tech that they have and all these different issues around the hardships they were facing. What they failed to do is focus on the customer and the value that they get from bare metrics. They didn't focus on um, the additional value that you're going to get for this 2x or 3x price hike. So as you're go ahead, Jane, were you going to say something? Yeah, I want to uh, want to take our uh, listeners on a slight detour. We just recently published an article with uh, tearing down multiple pricing update emails, more specifically 14 of them, including the bare metrics one. So the oh, link is in the chat. Beautiful. Uh, Thank sorry you. Sorry for uh, sorry for the detour. Please keep going. No, that that's um that's perfect. Yeah. So as you think about messaging, there are three things that can really help. You want to keep it simple. I don't want you to overcomplicate this. If you run a business and you don't have tons and tons of users, or if you have a certain tier that you want to increase first, you could personalize those emails. So if, if you're in a position where you have the ability to personalize the emails with merge fields, with value metrics saying, you know, you got this much, you create, if you have a video app, for instance, <clears throat> and your users create videos, to let them know how many videos they've created and how long they've been a customer as you're communicating this, um, this message around the, the price increase. Again, don't make this about you. It's not about the hardships you're facing. It's about what you're doing as a business to better serve these customers at the end of the day. So you wanna remind the customer of the value. And it's not, it's not a bad thing to offer flexibility. Be very clear in the email that if somebody is facing a hardship or if the price increase is something they just, they, they can't do, have them just respond and make sure that you have a human on the other side of that email that can get back to them. One example that um, works really well is, I know people use the term grandfathering in where you've got a bunch of legacy accounts and they're at a very low tier. You need to increase all of those. And um, those are the hardest ones to do. It's not as difficult to increase prices for new customers, but I'm really focused here on Let's increase prices for all these existing accounts we have because now they're more expensive to service. So you could do a rolling increase. It could work really well if you say, hey, in, in three months, we have to do this. Or you could say, hey, here's a 10% discount for life. Like we value you as a customer. By the way, the term grandfathering, it has a very sad historical uh, background for U.S. Mm. folks. Uh, specifically black people. So if you try to be more politically correct, it would be better to say legacy pricing or something like that. But grandfathering is a very common term in the SaaS industry. So there is no blame for sure. But um, so yeah, that we know these days. <laughs> this, uh, yeah, this vernacular, it's, it's hard to, it, it can be difficult to escape it, particularly when it's the term most people use to describe this kind of a uh, price increase. But yes, I, I agree. We have to um, find something better to describe this behavior um, and, and how you 
you know, I like to say legacy plans increase. How do you increase your legacy plans? Yeah, the same goes for whitelist and blacklist. And we operate in the email industry. These are like very common terms, but they also have a very similar set, like wow. heritage, unfortunately. Yeah. Wow. I didn't realize Probably that. should find some, some reading. Yeah. <laughs> we all learn. Yeah. yeah. That's something everybody uses, um, you know, mm -hmm. across the board here. All right. So at the end of the day, you know, you've got these concerns, you know, you need to raise prices. There's this fear that's still there. You worked hard to, to get these customers, acquire them, build relationships, nurture them. And they're here now. They've been here for a long time and you, you don't want to lose them for whatever reason. And this is where my current product can really help you out. So we built this tool called Turnkey that I mentioned at the top of the call. And we are kind of a one-stop shop for retention. But something really cool that Turnkey can be used for, and one of our first customers was actually, um, this is Hype Fury. I don't know if you're familiar with Hype Fury. They're a uh, um, Twitter our customer tool. at you, Our customer at Useless too. Uh, cool. It, it's a phenomenal service. And um, I mean, we're trying to get more uh, proactive with creating content and, and having Twitter automation. I mean, it's, it's amazing. I, I couldn't sit around all day and just you know, write tweets. Um, but yeah, they reached a point where they, they launched the product and it was way too low. They priced it way too low initially, as most founders do. And they realized that we've got to go increase all of our pricing across the board. And it was, I think it was like a double, a doubling of the price. And they installed Turnkey just before that price hike went into effect. And uh, it was extremely valuable because they were able to use Turnkey. And on the next slide, I'll show you how you can mitigate price sensitivity and um, help kind of meet your, your customers who are price sensitive in the middle, rather than having them cancel. You can kind of make a, a discount concession and they get a great deal, a great perceived value. And um, you can save these customers for a longer period of time. In some situations, somebody goes to cancel because of the price hike. Well, if they get a good value and you can communicate it that, hey, like we value your business, we wanna offer a discount so that you're able to keep using this, that's a win for everybody. You as a business retain the customer, they're getting a better value and are able to make their budget work for your product. Uh, one thing I, I should mention here, um, this boosted revenue is not, this is not High Fury. this is another customer, but this is just a sense of what you can save with Turnkey. So this would be revenue that would have otherwise been lost and somebody installed Turnkey, each time a user clicks that cancel button, does not cancel and ends up either taking a deal or pausing or using another reason to be retained this revenue compounds over time and that's a beautiful thing about when you talk about churn you talk about retention you're working on very slim margins and a 0.5 percent reduction in your overall churn rate can make all the difference in terms of your business your ability to be profitable and your ability to keep growing particularly if you as a business are seeing that your business is, is um, plateauing, you're hitting an asymptote where you can see, okay, at this point, churn is going to exceed my growth rate. Um, and it's way better to have something like this in place prior to reaching that point where you start to plateau off, particularly if you have any aspirations for an acquisition. Uh, big mistake I made, slight tangent here, but big mistake I made when we were talking to brokers and looking to sell wave our last business, I just assumed that, you know, you get a value multiple based on uh, whatever your revenue was. So I was like, okay, four, four times or five times our MRR is what we'd be acquired for. And I realized that in a lot of acquisitions, purchasers don't use that. They want to look at your trailing 12 month profits. So if you're looking to be acquired, it's very important to look out 12 months, say, what can I do now today to start increasing our profit margins? and decreasing churn, just the fact that decreasing churn increases your uh, deal value and upside as well. But yeah, overall on the left, on the right hand side here, you can see on average customers will lower their cancellations by 42%. We also have Dunning or failed payment recovery. Those customers um, are recovered at a 68% level. And then lifetime customer value, extremely important as you think about the cost of bringing customers on, that increases by 28%. Uh, for these customers that decide not to cancel. And overall, 
um, our average customer boosts their MRR by 14%, which is it's pretty tremendous. So this is just a, a quick example. I ran out of time building my deck here this morning, but uh, I just wanted to give you a quick preview of what this would look like. So a user comes to the site, they click that dreaded cancel button and they get a survey. Survey says, you know, uh, why are you canceling? Are you, is it, um, are you leaving for a competitor? Are you not using the product? Does it no longer fit your budget? And with Turnkey, you could have an offer automatically that says, if they click, do, does not fit my budget, you can tailor a custom discount and custom copy that caters to this specific user. And this is extremely valuable when it comes to increasing your prices. As you can imagine, you've got people who, if you're doubling pricing and you wanna make sure that if a user is, has a big problem with that and they're, just, they're not gonna email you to let you know that pricing's too high, they're just gonna go cancel for whatever reason because it's, it seems too expensive. You can meet them in the middle and basically roll back the pricing for the users that we're gonna leave because of that. And that's the power here. You can automate retention of users who are price sensitive through a price hike. So you get all the benefits of the price hike and you can mitigate the downside for price sensitive users. And uh, some people have, um, they have moral issues. They say, you know, are they not valuing my product enough to pay the full value? And, and you've got to really put yourself in um, a customer's shoes. We've done interviews with end customers who receive an offer like this, and they're not gaming the system or anything like that. They genuinely have budgetary constraints like all of us do. And it's great to be able to have some kind of offer that allows you to continue using the product. And it's not so, just about LTV, but also that most times every user is a your fan and like your mini marketer in terms of referrals and your product interfacing other people. So it's not just about money. It's about other aspects of the product growth. Exactly. Um, and, and another thought too on that is with a tool like Turnkey, you can gain a lot of qualitative insight around your pricing. If people are, if you get a sudden influx of people who are going and they're clicking that cancel button and they're choosing budget, we report that to you in a nice dashboard. And you can see, okay, well, this month we had an uptick of you know, 20%. More users are saying price sensitivity. Or on the other hand, if you've got a very low number moving through that, it's a no brainer. You've, you can increase prices because there's a willingness to pay from your core audience. Um, so yeah, there's definitely the quantitative logical side of retaining more customers, boosting your revenue. And then there's this qualitative side too, something very hard to do, understand a consumer's ability and willingness to pay for your service. I know we're tight on time. I just wanted to stop there, open it up to questions and comments. I'm going to ask a couple of questions from myself first, because we decided to address them originally. And one of them is, I have been anticipating it, so you have to treat me now. Uh, how to track conversion dips? How does it help you um, understand whether you've gone too far? Like, what is this method for tracking conversion dips? Tell me that again. Uh, like, elaborate. Um, I recall in your article, there was a, sec mm -hmm. a section in the end where um, one of the methods, okay, let me actually find it. Uh, one of the methods, for it was to okay let me let me let me find it monitor your funnel and track conversion dips uh, recalibrate and try again so in yes. order to find the inflation pressure pricing equilibrium that i love the phrase how to find yeah. that yeah price equilibrium i've you know i've called turnkey sometimes a market maker for customers and businesses understand trying to be that middleman and understand What's the willingness to pay and sensitivity? And what is the business able to sacrifice in the short term to keep a customer longer term and make sure they're they're happy and able to pay? Um, Turnkey offers a few things for that. We have robust reporting around um, how users are trending based on pricing plan. You can even segment by pricing plan. So if you, in, in some scenarios, it might not make sense to increase all of your pricing across the board. You might only want to increase a certain tier or a certain plan. And in those situations, you can drill down and segment and continually iterate on pricing using a tool like Turnkey. There are other tools out there too that help you track conversions and uh, drop off over time. Things like um, 
like, I mean, Google Analytics is one of the you know most robust tools. I don't, I'm not a huge fan anymore. It's too complicated to use, but a number of analytics tools can allow you to track these kind of conversions. But if you want to get deeper and really understand how people behave, we have optional session recording. So as users are interacting with that flow, you can see how long do they hesitate and think before they accept an offer. And that kind mm -hmm. of qualitative information, it's, you know, it's invaluable to say, okay, they, they waited 30 seconds and then they eventually clicked this offer. That must mean it's, it's kind of like just the right place. They think about it just long enough. If everybody's clicking right away, right away, right away, you realize, okay, this is too good a deal. They're not as pricey. <laughs> So you can continually iterate with a tool like Turnkey. And if you were to roll out multiple price increases, um, this would be a invaluable tool. Now that introduces some complexity when it comes to communicating that. You don't want to say, all right, everybody, we're you know increasing by 50%. And then the next month you do it again, people are going to get tired of that really quickly. So you want to be careful. Um, you could test it across different plans, different tiers, that sort of thing. I want to reiterate that uh, testing your new pricing with new customers is really almost painless. Like you don't really betray anybody. It's just a marketing move, just a marketing update. So like that is not a problem. What what is most problematic and sensitive is uh, addressing your existing users. That 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 involves politics indeed. Yes, and depending on whether you're a, a B two C uh, type of SaaS business or B2B, B2B can be more complicated because there are multiple stakeholders. You may have to get some kind of approval. Um, so your messaging will vary. Um, I love that you guys have all those sample emails. I imagine you have one for multiple different scenarios that people can use. Um, what would be the DIY version of what you're offering in terms of uh, this, the, the deals that you can offer? I imagine one is DIY, uh, Cancellation flow instead of using yours? Yes, yes. Um, and this goes back to what we built at Wave initially. We had no idea mm -hmm. what to do about churn. We'd spent $30,000 on consultants. Did It did not move the needle. And we just started playing around with our offboarding flow. And it's crazy to me. This is, this is wild, but um, people spend so much time optimizing onboarding and making that painless and A-B testing it and doing all kinds of craziness around getting people there. So why aren't you doing that when people exit? Why, why aren't you doing that when people leave? And you know you can capture some of that with a simple survey. You could use Typeform uh, or something else like that that's virtually no code. And uh, you can start collecting that. That's going to give you qualitative data. If you want to automate the cancellation and discounting and pausing, you can integrate with Stripe or Paddle or whoever your billing provider is. and um, that would be one example where you create this embedded flow and you build out some API endpoints and it can take a while. I think that was our key motivation <laughs> for building Turnkey is we realized with Wave, we weren't focusing on our core product. We weren't able to build features because we were so focused on all this billing infrastructure. Uh, we spent a good year at Wave just optimizing, offboarding. And we said, well, we got acquired now. What are we going to build next? Let's build something for founders so that they can save all this time. They don't have to, you know, get into billing code and you know, spend months and months and months working on this. Rather, they can focus on their core value proposition. Let Turnkey handle that for them with like a, the automated suite of tools. I guess the most uh, simple workaround would be to just, uh, you know, be a ferocious uh, manual customer success person, and you can also keep suggesting those discounts um, retro actively retrospectively when uh, after people cancel just make I, I sure you don't remove their data <laughs> first yeah <and> I'm <laughs> glad, that I'm, can be a bummer i'm really glad you mentioned the reactivation um idea like here's a discount like if you want to come back yeah, there are a lot of different messages you could use and offers you can use to get people to come back it is very 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 hard there's something psychologically mm -hmm. that happens it's kind of like a breakup so once somebody, <laughs> cro one, it, it's it's something we've tested and we were going to build out this really advanced suite that does this. And as we test the data, we realized people don't, it, once they leave, a little offer is not going to get them back. You have to intercept that churn intent before it happens. When somebody clicks the cancel button, they are intending to churn. And if you can offer them something before they finalize that decision, 
even having the survey form up and the offer, sometimes they don't even take an offer. They'll just say, oh, right, uh, let me think about this. You're trying to disrupt that thought pattern by reminding them of the value and showing them that you can offer them something to help them stay. So I'm glad you mentioned the reactivation thing. Um, we've tried that and it's just not as effective. We'd get like one out of 50 of those would have a, even a response. I'm I'm equally glad that you have data that proves that those efforts are less uh, productive. We do have a number of awesome questions. Let's do let's do them relatively fast. Uh, so okay. one from Ricky: Are there certain subsectors that you believe are more challenging to raise prices in? Those price sensitive ones, for instance, ninety five percent of our customers are nonprofit organizations. Guess what do we do? Is the ultimate question. Yeah. I got I cut my teeth in the nonprofit sector at a company called Blackbaud. Um, and yeah, I, I'm very familiar with that um, industry. It's it's challenging, and particularly when there are stakeholders. Uh, I think that's the part that changes the calculus. If it's a contract, an annual contract, or if there's any legal element to it that requires additional ap approval. Um, in that situation, hopefully you have a customer success person or an account executive, somebody that has maintained a relationship with that. If you don't though, if it's, um, let's say lower touch uh, nonprofit sector, uh, I think you just, I, I still think you just have to test it and see sometimes these uh, nonprofits, they have a, a set budget that they have to spend every year or that budget gets axed. Um, one thing I learned at Blackbald was there are a lot of sales that happen at the very end of the year for nonprofits because they, they're trying to spend the budget so they can maintain the same budget the following year. Um, so again, I, I know that it you're going to get different mileage based on the type of nonprofit, but overall, I don't think it changes anything substantially unless you've got a lot of additional stakeholders. Another question from Lee Fogel and well, I can can stop but notice that they have the same last name, but maybe that's uh, your brother or sister. Uh, no. <laughs> what, what do they say? Um, their last name is the same as yours. That's what I'm saying. Uh, so the question is your comment about using personalized metrics uh, to focus the customer on the value as the driver of price increases is spot on. Uh, I guess the key question here is about personalized metrics. Maybe you want to give an extra comment about it. Yeah. The Turnkey allows you to segment based on the customer. So rather than having like a type form up where everybody gets the same survey, they get the same discount. With Turnkey, over time, you learn how much each user is willing to pay based on some of these things we've talked about. You can offer up a different flow with a different discount. One great example is um, customers that have only been around for two or three months. Uh, they may have failed to activate or they may have, um, they may just be hopping around between competitors. You could offer them a higher discount or a lower discount based on what you know about those customers. So yeah, the, the value driven approach to pricing and price increases is extremely important. And particularly as we think back to that bare metrics email and how it was just totally generic. They didn't really focus on what did you as an individual get out of this product? Another question from Ricky Chilcott. Is there a general rule for how frequently you should raise prices? Should we default to doing it as frequently as Netflix does? <laughs> so uh, has anybody tried to cancel Netflix and looked at that cancel flow? Um, it's in <laughs> it's <mean>? interesting. <laughs> so, so that was eventually we were, we were at our wits end trying all these different things to cut churn. And I said, what does Netflix do? What does Hulu do? What does YouTube Live do? They have teams of... 10, 20 people. And that is their only job is to work on the offboarding flow. Um, I think that Netflix is, they raise prices once every year or once every two years. I think you should be raising prices every year. Yeah, I do. I think it should, it, it shouldn't be arbitrary. You should make sure you can tie it to the value customers are getting from it. But, um, you know, if you look at Netflix's um, performance over the last few years, it's the market's getting more crowded. They are having a lot more pressure. So they have to increase. Um, but yeah, just to go back to remind you, you're not going to nail this the first try. And if inflation stays hot, it's, you're going to be behind the eight ball again before too long. So the main thing I want to focus on, if you are somebody who's been running a SaaS business for four or five years and you have not increased prices, it's not optional. You have to do this if you care <laughs> about the long-term success of your business. 
question from Velislav Stoyanov. Any ideas how to deal with customers who just remove their billing details from their accounts? Uh, this virtually bypasses the cancellation flows, right? It, it does in a way. Um, you would still want to use a survey to understand, like, why are these users leaving? Um, you can also, I, I don't know how large of a problem this is. I would try to take a sample of those users and interview them if, it, if the unit economics makes sense, if it's a large enough value on the account uh, to justify doing interviews like that. But at minimum, you should have a survey in place that's able to um, capture the uh, individual reason for leaving. So at the, at the bare minimum, even if you're not retaining them, you know why they're leaving. Also, it's it's the same thought as for people who start a trial with an empty debit card. You know, like you you do what you can do there, but after all, it's just it's just somebody who won't activate or uh, is not a good customer for you. So don't worry that much. I guess. <laughs> yeah, and, and it goes back to like the value. They're not getting the value out of the product. You weren't going to be able to retain them anyway because at the, at the end of the day, it wasn't even price sensitivity. They were just bouncing around between apps probably. Yeah, yeah. Another question from Lee. Uh, well, not a question, I guess, an observation. Uh, so we built an insurance business process, uh, SaaS business of uh, 150 million revenue in the 2000s. Well, congrats on that. Overall profitability was good, but we lacked insight into the tiers of customer transactions. Price increases were d difficult to develop by tier. Turnkey could have helped us immensely. So another compliment in that's, your that's cool. uh, <laughs> in your direction. That's great. All right, Ricky is saying thank you, Nick. Um, so one last do and one last don't when it comes to price increases. Say, say that again, Jane. Uh, give us, uh, as, as to close off this session, um, give us one last bit of advice, one do and one don't for uh, price uh, increases at SaaS. Yeah. Don't send out a blanket generic message to all your users telling them they're going to, you're going to increase <laughs> prices without recourse. Uh, that seems obvious to me, but um, may not be obvious to everybody. Uh, do use turnkey uh, shameless uh, plug of our <laughs> company or build a build a flow yourself that can do something similar and there are a lot of in talented engineers out there that are perfectly capable of building something like turnkey the data we have shows that the amount of revenue can you can retain and um, the fact that you can also keep your customers happy while doing that it's it's a no-brainer uh, having something like this in place also reduces the fear of increasing your uh, your pricing Great advice. Uh, thank you, Nick. We've got one more little question and we've got time. So uh, Velislav is asking, have you had experience with user bases abusing the cancellation flow for discounts? This is so funny. We get this, call. this is a great question. We get it every single demo call, every sales call. Great, I'm on. great. People ask this, <laughs> it, it's, it, and it, you're right. Um, so one cool thing about Turnkey, you can rewatch the sessions and about, you know, one out of 30, one out of 40 times, you'll see somebody that they know what this is. They like hop around and try to pick different things. Um, but it's kind of like moot because if they're shopping around for a discount, well, that shows something about the customer. They, they have some kind of price sensitivity, right? And if they accept a discount, you know, at the end of the day, is it, is it really that bad? I mean, you retain them. Um, it's not the majority of users that do this. It is a smaller minority. And those customers who actually are, we've watched this, the customers who try to game it, they stay just as long as anybody else. So in my opinion, it's it's one of those things that we watch for, but it's really not a problem at the end of the day. There is a certain category of customers, uh, even at the point of sign up, they want to have a deal. Like they would reach out to support asking for a deal. And, and most, most likely they will get it. It's just the type of a customer they are. And that's, I guess, can be a little bit geographical. I'm not going to point out. <laughs> um, no, no, I mean, that, and that, that's like haggling too, is right? a tradition in some countries. So that's what it they is, do. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah. And sometimes it doesn't make sense if, if it's a lower ARPU, lower value, um, not saying low value customer, just a lower value account overall. 
you can't just discount everybody, especially if you have high volume. Um, but that is something that people value. They value the ability to feel like they're winning one over on you or negotiating. And if that makes them feel better and they continue using your product and paying, then it's better. And this is also worth noting, SaaS is a unique business because your margins tend to be so high. You have room to offer these sorts of things. A lot of businesses aren't lucky enough to have that type of, of fat margin where they can play around with large discounts. It helps in terms of uh, operations to have like a portfolio of discounts uh, at your uh, customer success disposal. For example, you know that your bootstrapped companies get this and this percent off, and then you have one like medium sized discount that you know you can apply for sure without asking anybody for occasions like like this one. Then people just need a sweetener for the deal. So it's totally just another practice uh, you can introduce. They will be a squeaky wheel, though. Uh, <laughs> just from our <laughs> yeah, experience, well. yeah. usually they, they have a higher a higher support uh, requirement. Um, but again, it comes down to your business, like you were saying at the end of the day. It comes down to the individual business and uh, you know the volume, a lot of different things. Yeah. Yeah, I forgot to mention my, my favorite argument is that well, with those discounts and everything, the higher the baseline price you have. The, the more discounts you can ultimately give. So it always helps to start the conversation higher, right? Yeah, it, it really does. And I don't want to think of it as like the high, higher paying customers are subsidizing the lower cost accounts. Um, but in a way that that's kind of what's happening um, with the, the discounting. You're making it more accessible to people that couldn't quite afford it um, because larger some of the larger accounts are, it's nothing to them. Going back to Userlist and our uh, story of the few years, we have raised uh, pricing a couple times. Both times, it's been transformatively good. Like, mm -hmm. it has transformed the kind of customer we're getting. It has transformed the type of conversations we're having with them. It's just been great all around about the perceived value, the investment of time and energy that goes alongside that money and all, so on and so forth. I can, I can just praise that <laughs> for a long time. Yeah. Well, Nick, thanks so much once again. Amazing advice, uh, amazing wisdom. Uh, good luck with uh, growing your own pricing and customer base and uh, hope to see you again here in line. Thank you for having me. This is, uh, you know, I've been wanting to share my pessimistic spiel and uh, also <laughs> how my new business can help people. Um, but again, yeah, if you have any questions at all, you can reach out to me on Twitter. My DMs are open and I'm not a pushy salesperson at all. Like if you have questions about this and you're trying to you know, build your own and stitch it together, let me know. I'm happy to help. All right. Well, uh, thank you once again. Well, there is a tiny question. Can we do one tiny question from Villaslav again? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> um, any advice how you decide the price hike? I guess the numeric hike uh, or the timing or both? Uh, maybe uh, yeah, clarify. I I could have gone more numeric, into this. Numeric, numerically, yes. Um, there are a few factors. I'll try to keep it short. Um, part of it comes down to, if we're talking about inflation, how much are your costs going up as a business? So that's important. Um, and what are your plans for the product? And I, I don't think numeric, I think you have to look at it in percentages because these are the inputs that you're dealing with. The cost of your service is increasing by a percentage. And if you understand that, that can help you to just find that right balance. Uh, but the bigger thing is, where do you want your company to be in a few years? Um, do you want to continue hiring and building and growing? Because if you do, you need to be more aggressive. And um, at the end of the day, it is kind of arbitrary where you've got to just pick something. I think uh, psychologically, 50 a uh, 50 percent price increase is pretty modest i think doubling pricing is what a lot of people could do and they don't realize it um, but yeah that's that's why i do it i view it as a percentage-based increase yep yep i love the angle for our conversation today because usually the justification for price increases you know perceived value your you know arpu the viability of your business but you're just going from from the inflation standpoint that's it's refreshing, refreshingly yeah, pessimistic. And, yeah, and, well, and, and, and this talk is is focused on on that angle. I mean, you definitely can justify around value if your customers are getting tremendous value. And in fact, we had to increase prices at Turnkey. You know, I'm I'm not a hypocrite. Like we 
we started out prices way too low and we realized like our customers are getting so much value. We want to build all of these new features. We've got NLP, we've got machine learning. That's expensive to run. We're looking to hire more engineers. That's so expensive. And it's like, you look at both things. It's like, we need to be here in the future to better serve our customers and deliver better ROI. Um, but also we know our, our inputs are, are increasing too. So. Yeah. Well, I guess we've got all questions from Veloslav. <laughs> Thanks everyone for joining. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you, Jane.